My friends, in this second lecture regarding the profound message of Fatima, I would like to focus specifically on what is referred to as the seventh message of Fatima, the December 10th, 1925 message from Our Lady of the Rosary to now Sister Lucia, who is in a convent in Spain, and as well talk about the theology uh, behind and in defense of this great promise of the graces necessary for salvation through the cooperation with the five first Saturday requirements. We'll also speak about the five offenses against the Immaculate Heart, which was revealed to Sister Lucia during the 1930s. And as well, we'll talk about the third secret of Fatima, or technically the third part of the secret of Fatima, which was revealed on July 13th of 1917. Let's go to December 10th, 1925. Again, an apparition to Sister Lucia, now a, a sister in a cloistered order in Spain. Uh, I'm going to read from her memoirs. This is December 10th, 1925 message. Uh, remember that oftentimes in the style of the day, they would refer to themselves in the third person, but this is Sister Lucia talking about herself and Our Lady, as you'll see. Quote, on December 10th, 1925, the Most Holy Virgin appeared to her, that being Sister Lucia, and by her side, elevated by a luminous cloud, was a child. The Most Holy Virgin rested her hand on her shoulder, Lucia's, and as she did so, she showed her a heart encircled by thorns, which she was holding in her hand. At the same time, the child said, so Our Lady has her heart encircled with thorns, holding it out to Sister Lucia, but it's the Christ child who speaks first and says, quote, Have compassion on the heart of your most holy mother, covered with thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment, and there is no one to make an act of reparation to remove them. Then the Holy Virgin said, quote, Look, my daughter, at my heart, surrounded with thorns, with which ungrateful men pierce me at every moment by their blasphemies and ingratitude. You at least try to console me and say that I promise to assist at the hour of death with the graces necessary for salvation all those who, on the first Saturday of five consecutive months, shall confess, receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the Rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the Rosary with the intention of making reparation to me. So, my friends, let's go over that again. Our mother takes her heart from her chest, if you would, holds it out to Sister Lucia Hart, you know, pierced with thorns. The Christ child asks for compassion on the heart of his mother, pierced constantly. Uh, you know, the precise words in, in, uh, as Jesus speaks, uh, covered with thorns with which ungrateful men pierce, me, pierce it at every moment. Now, we'll comment on, on this in just a moment. Then Our Lady herself confirms what Jesus says and that her heart is, is pierced by ungrateful men, blasphemies, ingratitude at every moment. And there's no one to offer reparation. There's no one to offer, as she says specifically, um, there's no one to make an act of reparation to remove them, end quote. Then uh, you have this dimension of... Uh, the, the requirements, the, the conditions, if you will. So both Mary, uh, first Jesus, then the, Christ, the, the child Jesus, then Mary, uh, re, confirming the need for reparation, and then Our Lady says, okay, this is how it's done. So what are the conditions for obtaining the graces, she says, the promise of the graces of salvation? Now, keep in mind, this is very similar to the same theology of the scapular, that what does Our Lady need? She needs free will, she needs human consent before she can bring the graces of salvation. Her task is to, as mediatrix of all graces, is to distribute the saving graces of Jesus Christ. 
She can't do that unless there's an opening. Humans love concrete, specific ways by which they can open their hearts to the graces of salvation. That's why every sacrament has a, a, a matter and form to it. Every sacramental uh, are, are swarmed by, by children as well as adults. Something concrete, something tangible, the holy water, the incense, etc. Uh, and here, you're talking about a specific way you could say, yes, I want the graces of salvation. So what's the specific way? Once again, she says, uh, all those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months shall confess, number one, receive Holy Communion, number two, recite five decades of the rosary, number three, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the rosary, number four. Now, some might say, well, isn't there a redundancy between three and four? I mean, praying the rosary is, is three, four is meditating on the 15 mysteries. Well, Our Lady wants to make sure that meditation happens. There's great saints like St. Francis de Sales and, and certainly Alfonso de Liguori say it's, it's a necessary component of salvation. You have to ponder Jesus with love, and that's what the rosary is. Uh, but sometimes we don't do that, and therefore the reference, the call to pray the rosary sometimes does not ensure that deeper prayer of meditation, which should, in fact, be part of every rosary praying. Uh, the local uh, patriarch of Lisbon made the comment that this fourth condition can be satisfied by pondering any or all of the mysteries of the rosary for that 15-minute period of time. Uh, there's, there's freedom in that regard. Critically important, my friends, those four things done on five consecutive first Saturdays with the following required intention with the intention of making reparation to me. That is, you know, you know the power, the importance of intentionality. Why are you doing this? This must be done, confession, and by the way, within, any, within eight days of the first Saturday, also as pastor applied by the, uh, by the uh, patriarch of Lisbon. Confession, receiving Holy Communion, five decades of the rosary, 15 minutes, of meditating on, on, on any of those elements, they all must be done with the intention of making repar reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, I want to go back to what both Jesus and Mary said, the Christ child and Mary said, about how the heart of Mary is being pierced by the sins of ungrateful men at every moment. There are two possible theological interpretations of this reparation. One is, well, even though she's saying her heart is pierced at every moment, what she really means is that this is just to offer reparation to her heart while she was on earth. Because once she's in heaven, she doesn't need reparation. Okay, that's position A. Uh, I quite frankly don't find that particularly satisfying, but it is a, a, a theological position. Position B is, no, she, she means what she says. Even in heaven, there's two hearts that can still suffer mystically. The heart of Jesus, that is also the heart of the church. And so as the members of Christ suffer, so does Jesus suffer. This is what he implies when he comes to uh, Paul, uh, to be Paul, Saul. Uh, why are you persecuting me? The heart of Jesus can suffer. Also the heart of Mary because she's mother of the church. She's mother of the mystical body. In fact, she's mother of all humanity. She sees every abortion, every act of, of marital discord, human trafficking, euthanasia, uh, global uh, acts of violence. She sees every you know, really diabolical act that's going on with, with ISIS uh, right now. She suffers mystically. Some might say, well, it's not possible to have the beatific vision and to suffer mystically. And that would be incorrect because Jesus, while he's on the cross, has access to the beatific vision. If he chooses not to use it, that's his own divine uh, human prerogative, but he does have the beatific vision, and yet he suffers. He suffers more than anyone else. So they're not incompatible. So the hearts of Jesus and Mary, because Jesus being the head of the church, Mary being the mother or the, the, the neck of the mystical body, as Berger would say, continue to suffer as we suffer. Therefore, it's appropriate we would offer reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus, as we hear in the apparitions to St. Margaret Mary, uh, back in the 17th century, and to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, uh, as 
as, as you know, manifested at Fatima, but look and, and, and ponder how much heaven wants this, that heaven would give Our Lady license to offer the graces necessary for salvation for those who do these acts in reparation to her Immaculate Heart. Now, as I mentioned, uh, sometime significantly later in the 1930s, it was actually the spiritual director of Sister Lucia asked her, why five first Saturdays? Why not seven or three or twelve? Why five? And so Sister Lucia asked Jesus, and Jesus responded, it is in reparation for the five major offenses to the Immaculate Heart. And he designated these five. Number one, the denial of her Immaculate Conception. Number two, the denial of her perfect and perpetual virginity. Number three, the denial that Mary is mother of God and mother of all peoples. Now, you might want to stop there and say, well, wait a minute. Those are all doctrines and dogmas. What, what's the big deal? Why would Mary be so upset about that? Because, my friends, the dogmas of Our Lady reveal the person of Mary. Could you imagine going up to a faithful religious sister and say, Hi, sister, you know, I don't believe you live poverty, chastity, and obedience, but don't take that personally. Of course you can take it personally because you're, you're denying her vocation. You're denying all that she is and has come under God's plan and with her heroic cooperation. And so when you deny Mary's Immaculate Conception, you're calling the Immaculate One a sinner. That's going to hurt her. You're saying that she wasn't perpetually virginal and she did not make that sacrifice and, and, and the discipleship of love unique of all creatures to Jesus. That hurts her heart. And clearly, denying that she's mother of God and mother of all peoples is going to hurt her maternal heart. Numbers 4 and 5 also manifest her heart. Number 4 is when we desecrate images of Our Lady, of course. Throw a family picture against the wall and watch the reaction of the family. Uh, and if you say, well, it's just a picture, uh, they're going to say, yeah, but it's a picture of us. <laughs> and look at how you treated it. So clearly, desecrating images of Our Lady are going to affect her immaculate heart. And number five really reveals the, the untold motherly, the immaculate, the pure, the greatest motherly heart of all time. When little children are led astray from her. Imagine how much that must hurt the, the mother's heart, where, where, where children are taught to distrust the mother of Jesus. Remember the old Latin maxim, uh, anima Christiana naturaliter Mariana. The Christian soul is naturally Marian unless someone contaminates that. If you love someone, you're naturally disposed to loving and respecting and, and even revering their mother. This is a great friend. I'm so grateful to end. I have you to thank because you're the parent. That's a, that's a co-natural process. It's, it's, a, it's a violence to that co-naturality when someone says, I love Jesus, but let's keep the mother away, or the mother is dangerous, or the mother is competitive. Only when contamination has been inserted, because the, the, the son loves the mother in ways we can never match. And the mother is never intrinsically a, a competition to the son, nor is it that way in God's family, as God has ordained his family, as Jesus ordains from Calvary, telling every one of his disciples to take her as mother. So this comes forward to so five offenses, Therefore, the five first Saturdays of reparation. Now, finally, I want to talk about the third secret of Fatima. As I mentioned before, this was re re revealed <coughs> in 1917. It's sent to Rome by the end of the 1930s and early 1940s. Excuse me. But it's not read until St. John the 23rd reads it in 1960 and discerns that it's not the right time to release it. So it is not until Pope St. John Paul II decides to release the third secret of Fatima. He announces this. Uh, it is announced at the May 13, 2000 beatification of Yashinto, uh, of Yashinto and Francisco at Fatima. And uh, the following month in June, the third part of the secret of Fatima is released. Once again, along with the call for the vision of hell, the call for the consecration of Russia, the remedy, and then this would come. So let me read to you what was revealed 
uh, released publicly, I should say, in June of 2000, and then offers some perhaps principles of hermeneutics or, or, or proper understanding of the message. From Lucia's diary, quote, After the two parts which I have already explained, at the left of Our Lady and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance, penance, penance. And we saw in an immense light that is God something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men and women religious going up a steep mountain at the top of which there was a big cross of rough hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city half in ruins and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him, and in the same way there died one after another the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. Now, how are we to interpret this? Let me say that there are, while well, once again, Cardinal Ratzinger said there's no official church interpretation of this third secret of Fatima. Uh, there are certainly two possible interpretations, at least two categories, fundamental categories. Category A is that this has all already happened. That this really, uh, as was one commentator uh, when the message was to be released, that this is basically just describing the, the persecution of the church during the time of communism, perhaps in the 50s, late 40s, 50s, even up into the 60s. So it's all past. The second perspective would be, no, this message certainly portends things yet to come. Now, let me offer just a few points that could assist in terms of, of determining at least the, the fundamental jest, the fundamental perspective on is it A or B? Are these all in the past or is, are these things yet to come at least in part and does it have a relevance to the 21st century? Well, first of all, the nature of prophecy. The nature of prophecy is where God or Our Lady or a saint or an angel reveals something for the sake of future conversion. If premise A is correct, that this all already happened, the purpose of the prophecy was lost entirely through... Uh, theoretically some absence of wisdom or prudence uh, in when it was released. But it's all, if you will, wasted because it's all already happened and therefore there was no value to the prophecy. If on the other hand, uh, this prophecy has been properly discerned in terms of its release by the Holy Fathers, John the 23rd said it's not our time. Uh, St. John Paul II determined that it was the right time to release it then we have a prophecy extremely relevant for today and even potentially for the future. Second element which could help in deciding the A or B uh, interpretation of the prophecy of the third secret, Sister Lucia clearly identified the bishop dressed in white as the person of John Paul II. Now, if that is the case, as one would typically accept, as if one's accepting a private revelation, one would accept the principal visionary's uh, uh, revelation, uh, instrument uh, of the revelation, if you will, the, the person that Our Lady picks to, to bring this forward. If it's a person of John Paul II, then you can't put it to the 50s and the 60s, certainly. And one would, I think, find it difficult to try to link it only with the assassination attempt because at that time, 
St. John Paul II was hardly, uh, you know, half trembling with halting step. So, Sister Lucia's identification of the person of John Paul II, whether it's individual or collective of John Paul and future popes, uh, certainly makes it relevant and not something just of distant past. Thirdly, the comments of Sister Lucia. Uh, this is an interview she gave on uh, May 31st of 1999 to the renowned Marian devotee and the Fatima devotee, uh, the late John Hafford. And in this interview, Sister Lucia remarked that we're only in the third day of the week of Fatima. And as Mr. Hafford asked her to clarify that, Sister Lucia went on to say that the first, quote, day of Fatima was the period of the apparitions. The second day was the historical period after the apparitions and previous to the consecration. She then said, we're only in the third day of Fatima, which is the day of post-consecration, which incidentally again confirms Sister Lucia's acceptance of the March 25th, 1984 consecration of St. John Paul II of the world inclusive of Fatima as satisfying the Fatima request. She then said, don't be in such a rush. There are still four more days of Fatima. Now, this was said in 1999. So I think it does confirm, again, the pastoral sense of St. John Paul II and of Pope Benedict XVI of saying the message of Fatima has great relevance to the 21st century. Uh, the reference that the annihilation of nations, at least as prophesied, uh, does not appear to have taken place yet. And uh, other elements within the third secret of Fatima, perhaps an ongoing or yet to come persecution of the church uh, is certainly a viable interpretation of this message. And therefore, prophecy has its purpose. That is to get us to live the message, the daily praying of the rosary, Eucharistic adoration, uh, which is also uh, part of what takes place in this Fatima message in terms of adoration and Eucharistic reparation, offering Holy Communion in reparation to God and also in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The sacramental life of the church with confession and mass. Uh, and again, this, this critical call to be co-redeemers, to make of everything we can a sacrifice, offering it to God in reparation for sin. And also, once again, the very strong theme of devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So, I would, I, I would conclude by saying, Fatima speaks to us today. Fatima is extremely relevant, and as mentioned before, the authentic apparitions that happen after Fatima seek its fulfillment because I think in any honest interpretation of the signs of the times, we are not yet smack dab in the middle of a content era of peace. Clearly, that cannot be uh, the, the reality of our present situation in light of the unprecedented chaos and crisis throughout the world. So, uh, let's listen to the message of Our Lady of Rosary, let's incorporate it, and let's see how authentic Marian messages since Fatima are seeking the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and its much desired and gravely needed uh, promise of an era of peace for the Church and for the world. Thank you.